From an international hero to a prisoner convicted of terrorism. We heard this week for the first time in almost two years from Paul Rusesa Bagina. He rose to fame after the story of his bravery in the face of genocide was told in the film Hotel Rwanda. He was arrested in 2020 by Rwandan authorities and charged with terrorist activities, though human rights campaigners say the trial was a sham and that Rusesa Bagina was a political prisoner. Facing stiff pressure from the international community, Rwanda's president commuted his sentence back in March, allowing him to move back to the United States. And just yesterday, the Hotel Rwanda hero delivered his first public comment since his arrest via a recorded message at the Oslo Freedom Forum. Listen in. Today I'm free man because of your voice and many like yours. It is my pleasure and honor to be addressing you. This time last year, I was in prison. You heard my story from my daughters who attended the Oslo Freedom Forum. All of you came together to advocate for my release and that of all political prisoners. And for me, you have succeeded. My freedom demonstrates that when you stand up for what you believe in, when you come together in a solidarity and are guided by the principles of human rights and democracy, you win. Time now for the exchange, and I'm very excited to say I'm joined by Karine and Anais Kanimba. They are Paul Rusesa Begina's daughters, and this is their first interview since their father won his freedom. Ladies, it is a huge pleasure to have you on the show. Welcome. I think this was a huge moment, not just for your father, not just for you and your family and friends, but also for all of those who fought for his release. Karine, start by explaining what this moment felt like and what it means. Well, first, thank you for having us on, uh, Julia, and thank you for sharing the video of our father. Um, this moment was very special for us. For two and a half years, our father had been silenced. He had been, t he, they had taken his voice away, and that had hidden him from the public eye. And yesterday, he got to share his public message of solidarity, of encouragement for people who are fighting for human rights, for people who are in situations like him, and reminded everyone to continue this this advocacy and to continue to speak up because that is how we can help others and, and uh, free other political prisoners. Yeah, I know it was a very powerful message and I can see it's um, emotional still for you guys. Um, and I guess I just want to go back to the moment that you found out that your father was going to be released and then you met him for the first time. What was that first hug like? And were there times when you feared you might never hug him or see him again? It was a dream come true, you know, when we, we saw our father for the first time, we touched him and to make sure that it was the real person that was coming to us. Uh, but in fact, what was really interesting our, our, during our reunion is that he's the one who consoled us. We were all crying and he told us daddy's home. And that was the best, best, best line of feeling that I ever had in my life, um, being able to touch him and be with him again. And it's been a renewal, a second, a second chance to life for all of us. Karine, you're smiling as well. Words of support and advice from the father when you feel like perhaps you should have been consoling him. Yes. <laughs> Can I ask how his health is? Because there were concerns about and reports of, of maltreatment while he was in prison. How is he doing now? Because I have to say in that video, he's glowing. He looked really great. Yes, he's um, he's doing better. Um, he's had one of the first things he did when he arrived back in the United States um, was to go seek medical uh, treatment, medical support, and and um, and he gains strength every single day. And his uh, both his mind and and body are 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 catching up, and and he's uh, he's getting stronger. Um, so we're very very grateful to have him here alive because um, we didn't at some point we thought that we might never see him again. But um, he's strong and um, and he's ready to continue um, to speak up for human rights. Yeah, and he said um, in his speech that that was presented there, there's more work to do, which I think was the standout phrase from what he said. And um, I know 
that's what you guys also advocate for. And the push now is to promote, be the voice for other prisoners around the world. Kareem? Yes, you know, this is a, it's a crisis happening. The, the fact of arbitrary detention, this is a tool that autocrats are using to stop dissident, to put people away, to silence activists. And it's happening all over the world. And so it's very important that we continue this fight. And uh, one of the best places to do that is at the Oslo Freedom Forum, where we're among many other people who've been political prisoners who are fighting for the, the former people they were living with and who also are fighting for others. And so it's really important to, to be able to be here and to continue but specifically with this community, because this community was key in helping our father uh, get, get released. I noticed and I, I was sort of looking back over the history of this part of the letter that your father wrote to the Rwandan government said that he'll live the remainder of his life quietly, that he'll leave questions specifically about Rwandan politics uh, behind him. But then I sort of also listened to what he was saying in that speech again and, and standing up for what you believe in and that there's more work to do. Um, do you think he will and that he can and that you guys specifically too can set aside what's taking place and what has taken place in your mind in in Rwanda and just let things lie? Or is that also still part of of the fight? You know, these um, uh, standing up for human rights is a responsibility for everyone. Um, and we have a responsibility to speak up for the people who are being silenced, who um, are being mistreated, whose rights are being violated. And we are sitting in places where we can do that. So I think it's everyone's responsibility to do so. And um, Anais mentioned the, the, uh, the hostage crisis. For example, there are many families um, whose loved ones are arbitrarily detained or held hostages in countries. And um, for example, in the United States, we have started, uh, along with other families, the Bring Our Families Home campaign to bring attention to these uh, wrongful detention and, and hostage taking situations. And when you know of the atrocities that the people are going through, when you know the pain of, and the suffering of, of these individuals and the pain of the, and the suffering of families like ours, we cannot remain silent. We have a responsibility to speak and we will continue to do so. Yeah, and you, you did a TED talk back in 2019 and I, I watched the whole thing and, and what stood out to me was you were talking about a sense of guilt and, and shame that you felt as a survivor and someone that lived through something so awful. Just to the point that you're, you're making about fighting for others perhaps and, and what they've been through is part of the healing process of what you and your family have suffered going on to help others. Do you ever really recover or is that just part of what drives you on to help others around the world? I think uh, it's both. I think we continue, it drives you to continue to help others. Um, I think we continue to heal and we continue to experience um, terrible situation. You know, we thought the genocide, the Rwandan genocide was the worst thing that could happen to us. And then two years ago, our father was kidnapped, um, tortured, subjected to a sham trial and jailed. And so this also was another crisis. And this is something that we as a family and us as a community and all the Rwandans who were also affected by, by, this, um, by this, this experience will have to heal from and, um, and we'll continue on to this journey and we'll continue to share the lessons that we learned as we heal and as we learn, um, but we, we are continuing uh, on forward. Yes, and I will just for completeness mention that the Rwandan government have said that they stand by uh, the charges and the conviction, of course, of your um, your father. I will just say that for balance. Um, and I ask final word um, on the work that you will continue to do, the people that you're still fighting for and will continue to fight for. As your father said, the work's never done and there's more work to do. Yes, there's always more work to do. And again, like I said, it's a crisis that we're living in today, mm -hmm. uh, this crisis of arbitrary detention. Um, and sadly, uh, we have to continue facing it and um, being able to help others. And as Karen said, as we heal as well, and the liberation of our father is a testament that when you commit to what you believe in, it is possible. And so we have, we're very blessed and grateful that we can live this happiness, but now we want to share with others. And I think that's another driver for us in order to want to continue because we know it is possible when you put all your mind into it. And so, you know, we're going to have to figure out the next chapters of our life. But one key part of this next chapter is, is that 
this advocacy in the work for political prisoner, people who are arbitrarily trained around the world, detained around the world, is going to be a part of it. Yeah, I've read your CVs. You are two incredible women for what you've been through. And um, I have full faith in your advocacy and um, the work you continue to do. Thank you once again for your time. And um, enjoy your father. Cherish him. Hold him tight. Karina and Anais Kanimba there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.